Thank you for joining us this evening for a virtual celebration of Florida Health Justice Project's first three years. You'll hear from our founder, meet our new director, explore our paths toward health justice, and raise your glass to honored guest. Throughout the event, please be sure to check the Zoom chat for additional content and information. And if you wish to support our efforts, you have the convenient option of either using your cell phone to text your donation or clicking the donate link in the Zoom chat and using PayPal to complete your donation. Hi, I am so grateful to you all for being part of a health justice journey, which for me started when I was a little kid in the early 1960s and I had to go into the hospital and I realized Everybody has to have insurance and healthcare ought to be a basic human right. Uh, in college, I did my senior thesis on why national health insurance failed to pass in 1974. I worked as a legal services health lawyer for over three decades. And so I've been on this health justice journey for a long while. And I am generally optimistic because progress is being made we passed Medicaid and Medicare and finally the Affordable Care Act. Uh, but for too many in Florida and other places, there are systemic barriers to care that are making the basic right uh, an illusion. And so the Florida Health Justice Project was founded to work on system-wide problems that are creating the barriers. And we do that by always working in coalition and using every tool in the advocate's toolkit. For example, we advocate with elected officials on issues like extending postpartum coverage and expanding Medicaid. And we advocate with state officials on issues like the failure to enroll former foster children into Medicaid. And because Medicaid is so complicated and most people don't even know they have legal rights or go to legal aid for an appeal, we provide advocate guides and consumer materials and trainings, and we publish nonpartisan data-driven research. We tracked the racial disparities in COVID-19 in Florida. And if absolutely necessary, we will file systemic litigation to enforce healthcare rights for vulnerable Floridians. And all of this work is possible because of individuals who decide they wanna join with us in fixing these system-wide problems. And these folks work with Florida Health Justice and our partners through sharing their personal stories or serving as plaintiffs in a class action, and they really keep us going. Um, it's, it's challenging to describe exactly what it is we do and how our work is making a difference in a 20 second elevator speech. But we have today a few short videos uh, that feature a couple of our key advocacy tools, story sharing and litigation, and a couple of the groups with whom our work is making a difference, older Floridians and new moms. And now I am so excited to introduce our master of ceremonies, Gordon Bonneman, who is one of the most effective, inspiring, and entertaining health justice lawyers in America. Thank you so much. Welcome. As a longtime admirer of Miriam and supporter of FHJP, it's such a pleasure to be part of this event to support their work. My wife, Claudia, and I have supported FHJP for three reasons. First, we love Miriam and we know how great she is at what she does. Two, though we're in Tennessee, we understand that what happens in Florida doesn't stay in Florida, but has an outsized influence on our whole country. And three, we believe that FHJP is another way of spelling love because health justice is all about concern for each other and nurturing of community. And no one does that better than the scrappy stalwarts of FHJP. It's a great pleasure to introduce the talented Mark Muller, who has written special lyrics to a well-known tune he wrote that I believe many of you will recognize. And I warn you right now that Mark's tune will cleverly install an earworm in your head that won't go away until you donate generously 
to FHJP. Stand warned, and now, Mark, take it away. Hi, I'm Mark Muller, I'm a songwriter, and I'm also a big supporter of the Florida Health Justice Project. I am guessing you are too, because you're virtually here. I'm also a dear friend of Miriam Harmatz, who's the founder. Uh, we've been friends since college, so a few years. Anyway, she is so dedicated and inspirational, and it's such a great cause that I was inspired to rewrite the lyrics of a song of mine. Uh, you might recognize it. Anyway, I hope you enjoy it. JP's on your side if you have a health scare. Take this occasion, make a donation, donate. Ooh, ooh. There is nothing to it now, just donate. Ooh, ooh. We know you can do it now, so donate. Ooh, ooh. They make sure that. And Miriam could use your support now Stop hesitating Why are you waiting? Donate Ooh. There is nothing to it now Just donate It's a pleasure now to turn it over to Allison Yeager. We're so fortunate that Allison left New York, brought her passion and nationally recognized expertise in maternal and child health to Florida, found her way to FHJP and is partnering now with some inspiring women's healthcare providers to make a dramatic difference. Hello friends. I wanna share with you some of our recent work on maternal health. A little background. You may well have heard Florida, along with much of the US, is facing a maternal health crisis. Poor outcomes are characterized by stark racial disparities and myriad strategies are essential to addressing the crisis. Among these is policy advocacy. Currently, Florida's Medicaid program covers nearly half of all births in Florida. Yet most moms covered by the program lose their coverage just 60 days postpartum. This leaves them without coverage to address postpartum depression and anxiety or chronic conditions like diabetes and hypertension. This coverage cliff puts moms at greater risk postpartum and at greater risk as they head into future pregnancies. In other words, this coverage cliff is one feature of the landscape that contributes to poor outcomes and to disparities in outcomes. When we learned last year that Georgia had extended postpartum coverage for moms, we thought if Georgia can do it, so can we. So we got to work. We did our research about what had been done in other states. We talked to allied legislators, including Representative Duran, who's honored here tonight, to test the waters, to plant a seed. And we talked to our coalition partners and allied organizations. We wrote up a fact sheet on the issue. We researched the issue of cost and the numbers of those who would be impacted. We researched legislative language and drafted a bill that our legislative allies would then carry. And we organized a coalition of advocates with over a dozen of us meeting first monthly, then bi-weekly to do the work. Coalition members wrote op-eds, held a Twitter storm, organized multiple sign-ons, one of which was signed by over 70 organizations and 200 individuals, including many of you. Thank you. And we sent out wave after wave of emails to legislators, to key committee members, to leadership, to appropriators, in step with the fast pace of our state's legislative session. We worked strategically 
and effectively and collaboratively. And we won. We won. A week before session ended, the chairs of the appropriations committees agreed to extend Medicaid's postpartum coverage in Florida from a meager 60 days to a full year. This is a huge victory for moms and babies who are otherwise at the periphery of the healthcare universe. This change will improve maternal health outcomes. It will dec decrease disparities and it reinforces the critical role that Medicaid plays in our healthcare system. In sharing this work with you, I also wanna note that it was made possible by seed funding that we received from the Family Foundation of a pediatrician formerly based in Florida, who is deeply committed to maternal health equity and access. Her gift directly translated into this extraordinary campaign. We thank you for doing what you can to help drive the engine of health justice forward. And now we'll hear from Jamara Amani, an extraordinary midwife and advocate who's working passionately to address racial disparities and maternal health outcomes and to create a culture of, and expectation of birth justice in Florida and across the South. Greetings, my name is Jamara Amani and I am a licensed midwife in the state of Florida. I am also the executive director of Southern Birth Justice Network and the co-founder of National Black Midwives Alliance. And I'm here to just tell you how proud I am of the work that we've done over the last year with Florida Health Justice Project to lead a coalition on postpartum Medicaid extension. This work is so important because families need support in the year after giving birth. We know that it's a myth that the postpartum period is just six weeks or eight weeks or 60 days. It really takes longer than that to recover from birth. And this is according to the CDC and many other major public health um, organizations. So following the science, it's really important that we acknowledge the time that it takes to recover from birth and give families the support that's needed during that period. And Florida has for a long time had just the 60 day Medicaid coverage with left, which left a lot of families, you know, looking for answers, looking for support and not being able to pay for that. Um, we know that 50% of the complications that occur um, from maternal health are happening in the postpartum period and that it disproportionately affects black and indigenous birthing people. So it's super important that this legislation passed, that we got this done, we got it written into the Florida budget, and that from now on, you know, families will be able to have that year of coverage. But this is just the beginning. We're going to be fighting for families in Florida from now until forever. Allison is doing some great work pursuing grants for maternal health advocacy, but it's our donations that are needed to ensure a solid foundation for FHJP's work in that and all other areas. Here's the great news. We're going to make it super easy for you to get March charming but persistent earworm out of your head. You can text now or go to FHJP's donate button where you can donate through PayPal or with your credit card. But wait for it. There's more. You can even indicate a preference there to target your money for maternal health or for any of FHJP's other important priorities. Give early, give often, give now. Representative Nicholas Duran is a true health justice champion. He has served in the Florida House of Representatives for over four years, where he's the ranking Democratic member of the House Health and Human Services Committee. Outside of his job in the legislature, he's the executive director of the Florida Association of Free and Charitable Clinics, and his community service roles are honestly too numerous to mention. A scan of the bills that Representative Duran sponsored this session tells you why we're honoring him tonight. He's a sponsor on bills to expand Medicaid in Florida, to expand access to HIV PrEP, to strengthen regulation on tobacco and nicotine products, to expand access to health data. And he's supporting children with incarcerated parents through legislation. And also through legislation, he's supporting housing for homeless people with special needs, supporting the transition from foster care to independent living, supporting substance use and mental health treatment, and so many more. So 
when we wanted an inside champion and an ally on the issue of extending postpartum Medicaid coverage, which you heard about earlier, we reached out to Representative Duran. He worked closely and strategically with Representative Camille Brown, herself a formidable advocate for women's health and black maternal health in particular, who sponsored the postpartum coverage extension. Representatives Duran and Brown pushed the item to the top of the healthcare agenda with the House Speaker, ensuring its success. This was truly a remarkable and a remarkably swift victory, which his passion, hard work, and commitment to justice made possible. We know that we will continue to look to Representative Duran as a leader and a health justice champion for years to come, both inside the legislature and out. We honor you and thank you, Representative Duran, for everything that you have done and continue to do on behalf of Floridians. I'm so honored for this recognition from the Florida Health Justice Project. Uh, I wanna thank my dear friend, uh, Miriam Harmatz, for being not only a friend and a colleague and a mentor, uh, someone who I learned from as far back when I was in law school and, and with Florida Legal Services, that's where I met you. Uh, and we really learned from Miriam about the importance of advocacy, the importance of not only just leveraging your law degree and your, your law learnings, uh, but also churning it towards the better good. Uh, and, and that's really what an organization and the work of the Florida Health Justice Project is. It is an advocacy organization that focuses in on uh, policy opportunities that we can take over that help our community, that help uh, Floridians uh, and those, those who are, are most susceptible, who are the most uh, in need. Uh, and so uh, the work I did with them this past session uh, in drafting legislation with Representative Camille Brown to extend uh, the postpartum care coverage in the Medicaid program uh, is a highlight of the kind of work that they have done. They came to me with an awesome opportunity and idea, uh, and then we worked together to make it uh, come to fruition. Uh, so I'm just so grateful for them. Uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity that they thought of me to engage me to work on such an issue. And I'm just really, really uh, honored that we were able to deliver this legislative session, that we had a bipartisan support on extending this coverage from, from, from the short 60 days to a full year, knowing how critical it is for uh, mothers and for those babies. Uh, so as, as, as a state representative, uh, as a member of this Miami-Dade community and as a friend of Florida Health Justice Project, I am just uh, honored to be with you all and thank, thank you for this, this kind recognition. And, and let me close with this. I think it is critical for us to support the important work that the Florida Health Justice Project is doing. I know this is a part of a annual fundraiser. Uh, I've been a, a, a associated and, and a part of it in the past. Uh, whatever you can give, to help continue this important work. They have moved the needle, uh, continue to move the needle and the dialogue when it comes to it. ensuring families, ensuring Floridians have the dignity of healthcare. Uh, so please, please give and give generously. And now for another short video, this one will tell us about the important work that FHJP is doing for seniors in Florida. Well, there's no group more vulnerable than low income seniors who need significant help with the basic activities of daily living. Tens of thousands are on a wait list for Florida's Medicaid program that provides home health services as an alternative to nursing home care. And those that do get into the program often face problems getting the care they need. For example, Aline, who is an incredibly resilient and articulate person, she never wanted to retire until her early 70s. She had spinal surgery that left her unable to use her legs. Uh, she lives alone in her own home. She absolutely does not want to go into a nursing facility. And even though her managed care plan totally agrees that she needs a home health aid every day to help her with the things she can't do from a wheelchair or from bed, like changing herself or bathing, Days and days have gone by when she doesn't have an aid at all. Uh, just imagine what that's like. And because there's no program that's more important or complicated, we've spent a lot of time creating tools for advocates and consumers, like this guide, which provides advocates with a roadmap for understanding 
issues uh, and over 160 endnotes with the uh, citations to the multiple sources of federal and state law and contracts. Uh, and we work hard to keep it updated. We just published the fourth edition. And we produced a consumer video in three languages, along with portal materials that we can update easily, explaining for families and individuals how to navigate this incredibly complicated program. I wanna share one example of why this kind of work, which sounds tedious and boring matters. A couple of weeks ago, I got an email from Thelma through our website, which said, I'm at my wits end. I had no option but to quit my job to take care of my mother who needs 24 seven care. Her Medicaid managed care plan had promised me that I'd be paid 40 hours a week, $10 and 76 cents an hour, but they keep cutting my hours. Um, so I sent her our materials and how to file an appeal. And we set up a time for an interview to talk about her situation. And after um, the call, I, I sent her an email saying, um, how did you find us? I, I want to be able to explain. We're having a virtual fundraiser, uh, how people find us and how our work matters. And she wrote back this message. Um, how I found you was on Google. And um, I believe it was a godsend. So it's messages like that and work like this and people like Thelma and Aline that really motivate us. In addition to the materials, we've also provided over 20 trainings and organized the first South Florida Health Justice Conference and the first statewide Elder Justice Conference. And we also do administrative advocacy, which is very wonky, but very important. For example, we're working to ensure that written notice is provided to everyone who applies for the program. And that has not always been the case. Uh, but through the administrative rulemaking process, it's being fixed. And I'm not gonna drag you through the weeds on how our work is making a difference, but you can check out our comment letters uh, and see the progress that's being made. And we're working now to optimize current opportunities to expand home and community-based services. This is huge. While the need existed before the pandemic, new federal legislation, some already passed and some introduced, builds on the increased understanding underscored by COVID of the need in America to support home and community-based services as an alternative to nursing home care. And one of the most powerful ways that FHJP is helping is sharing the stories of those who are suffering because Medicaid currently doesn't have enough money to maintain a sufficient workforce. We shared Aline's story with our national partners and this Wednesday, May 26, Aline will be speaking before a special congressional staff briefing on Medicaid home and community-based services. And we need your continued support to help with this transformational effort. Thank you so much. As you all know, FHJP is a feisty organization that punches way above its weight, and Medicaid class action litigation is one of its essential tools. There are three things for you to know about Medicaid. First, it's the nation's and Florida's healthcare safety net. Two, if you've seen one Medicaid program, you've seen one Medicaid program because each is different and only a Medicaid expert in Florida can really master the intricacies of Florida's Medicaid program. The Supreme Court has bemoaned the fact that the Medicaid Act is an aggravated assault on the English language, literally they said that, and that it's incomprehensible to the uninitiated. That means that literally no one in the cosmos, I say that advisedly, knows Florida's Medicaid program, including those state officials who run it, as well as Miriam, Allison, and Katie. They are a unique resource in a uniquely important state and they put their expertise to work in a vitally important way, as we're about to explain. Most low-income and vulnerable Floridians who are insured rely on Medicaid. And sometimes the Florida state agencies have policies and practices that violate federal Medicaid law. These violations hurt people across the state. As a statewide health law program, FHJP is positioned to work on enforcement actions that correct system-wide violations of the Medicaid Act. Well, without getting too much into the weeds, I had identified the fact that some very vulnerable Medicaid recipients, 
including kids with complex medical needs who had been getting Medicaid because they were adopted out of the foster care system, were being improperly terminated from Medicaid when they turned 18 without notice. Over a period of time with each individual case, I let the state agencies know that this was a violation of federal law. When it was not resolved, FHJP, along with Council from Disability Rights Florida, the National Center for Law and Economic Justice, and tremendous support from Jacksonville Area Legal Aid, filed a class action that ultimately resulted in over 30,000 people getting their Medicaid coverage restored. Now that's critical at any time, but we resolved the settlement in February of 2020. March of 2020, the public health emergency took hold and we are so proud that we were responsible for connecting people to Medicaid in a time that is incredibly critical to have health insurance. Also as a result of the lawsuit, the state fixed the underlying technology problems that were causing people to fall off Medicaid erroneously so that going forward, similarly situated people are not going to lose their healthcare coverage. I want to underscore that FHJP, we only file a lawsuit as a last resort. We always try to fix the problem by thoroughly explaining to the state how their actions are violating the Medicaid Act and give them a chance to fix it and are there to partner with them where they want our help. One example concerns the state's previous failure to provide Medicaid coverage for former foster care kids until age 26, a category of coverage created by the Affordable Care Act. Prior to January 2021, the process for application resulted in former foster care children losing their Medicaid. Shockingly, as of July 2020, through data analysis and public records request, FHJP discovered that only 67 children in the entire state of Florida were enrolled in the former foster care category. So the Florida Health Justice Project, the National Health Law Program, and the University of Miami Children and Youth Law Clinic sent the state a detailed demand letter describing the problem and requesting corrective action. The state responded positively. And as of January 2021 and moving forward, the state will automatically extend Medicaid eligibility to children aging out of the foster care system until age 26. We will see a significant increase in the number of children across the state who are enrolled in former foster care coverage. I tell you what, it would take the whole fundraiser to even give highlights of other Florida problems we are working on alongside our partner, the National Health Law Program, through our health law partnership. But I emphasize, we cannot do it without your continued support. Hello, my name is Sarah Summers. I'm the managing attorney of the North Carolina Office of the National Health Law Program, or NHELP. NHELP is a national public interest organization working to protect and advance the right to health care for low-income people and people with disabilities. We partner with advocates across the country to engage in litigation, advocacy, and education to preserve access to high-quality health care, particularly through the Medicaid program. Several years ago, we launched our Health Law Partnership Project to fund and work with state-based organizations to challenge policies that restrict access to Medicaid services. We immediately thought of the Florida Health Justice Project for a partnership, since Miriam and Katie have a long successful track record of holding the state agency accountable for its obligations to low-income people in Florida. They are talented and tireless advocates, and we wanted to provide them with the means to expand their work. Since the partnership began in 2019, we've worked with FHJP to employ administrative and litigation strategies to eliminate barriers to care for children, pregnant people, and low-income families. We've been delighted with the success of the project and amazed at the number and variety of issues that Katie has uncovered. We're in the middle of several cases now that can dramatically improve the lives and health of low-income Florida residents, and FHJP has the potential to do even more. We look forward to continuing to work with them. The excellence and importance of FHJP's work has enabled them to engage the indispensable, generous help of other firms but litigation is still costly and resource intensive. The impact, the return on investment is great, but we got to make the investment. So please text or press the donate button now to support FHJP's badass Medicaid advocacy. This next video features an incredibly important tool in FHJP's advocacy toolbox, story sharing. You're going to see how powerful it can be. 
I believe that the Florida Health Justice Project is making a difference for Floridians. And one way that that happens is through the Stories Project website. And as the Stories Project webmaster, I have seen firsthand how what we do can positively impact the lives of Floridians. Now, funny enough, my relationship with FHAP actually began with my wife, Marali Arroyo. She began working with the organization shortly after it started. It was through Morale that I learned how truly committed each team member is to ensuring that all Floridians have access to healthcare. It was during the summer of 2020 that I decided to join the team and lend my talents as a multimedia specialist. And the reason why I joined the team was because I truly feel that in this country, we cannot have health justice without racial justice. And we can't have racial justice without health justice. With the Stories Project, we work with storytellers on a variety of health justice issues, like elder health issues, long-term care issues, immigrant barriers to care, as well as people impacted by COVID-19. We also share the stories of those on Medicaid, and we show how important Medicaid is to these vulnerable Floridians and their family members. And because Florida has not expanded Medicaid, most stories are about people sharing what it's like to live without healthcare coverage. We hear from older Floridians, working parents, people struggling with illness and disabilities. Their stories are just so powerful. And the person on our team who works tirelessly to ensure that these type of stories get told is Blanca Mesa. Blanca is simply incredible. She's a public benefits lawyer, a journalist, and an incredibly effective advocate for Florida's most vulnerable. Blanca has been with FHJP from the beginning. One of her many functions is to interview the folks who contact us through our website or who are referred to us. Blanca talks to them about whether they would like to share their story. And she also explains why their story is so important and must be told. As Story Project team members, Blanca and I have read through every story. Many of them make you want to scream. Others make you want to simply cry. These stories are describing how people's lives are being shattered because Florida has not expanded Medicaid. Blanca and I hope you take some time. Take some time to go to the Stories Project website and read about the stories of these people who are struggling because they cannot access the health care that they in some cases so desperately need. And after you finish reading their stories, we hope that you decide to help support FHJP's advocacy efforts. It's true. Many lives have been shattered and their stories are heartbreaking, but their stories must be told. Florida Health Justice Project collaborates with storytellers on health justice issues like Medicaid expansion. We share stories to bring out the humanity behind the statistics. We tell the stories of those left behind, the neglected, the uninsured, those who are in pain, and those who scavenge to find life-saving medication. For some, sharing their story is a great relief. For others, retelling is reliving a trauma. But for all, it's empowering. It's a way for them to help others. And things can get better if Medicaid is expanded, if mental health services are provided, if homebound seniors get the care they need. First, Florida officials need to understand Floridians are struggling without access to affordable health care. Stories can bring that to light. I also spend a lot of time working with news media who are covering health justice issues, and that helps us amplify our work. A recent Washington Post story on Medicaid expansion featured two of our storytellers. One is Kelly Percival, an older worker who lost her job and then lost her health insurance just as she was trying to recover from an injury. A second one is Michael Smith, a younger worker with asthma and no health insurance who's forced to buy inhalers 
on social media marketplaces. These are two hardworking Floridians whose life would be much better if Florida expanded Medicaid. Sometimes people don't want to share their stories. They may feel embarrassed or ashamed to be seen in their darkest moment, but that's okay because Florida Health Justice Project helps them too. We provide the resources they may need, including information on where to find low cost or free health clinics or food and housing assistance. And that has been a lifeline to many during the COVID pandemic because so many Floridians suddenly found themselves without a job, hungry and on the brink of homelessness with no idea how to access the safety net system. And we have been there for them as well. I urge you to continue to support Florida Health Justice Project and our work, which is vital to the future of Florida. Thank you. You really want to read the moving, powerful stories on FHJP's website. Like all good advocacy, the role of the advocate is largely invisible and the story grabs and holds your attention center stage. But behind each story is a backstory of FHJP's technical skill and dedication that created a relationship of trust that empowered courageous clients to share those stories. In a divided society, human stories are able like nothing else to bridge divisions and touch human hearts. It's such important work and FHJP's effectiveness is reflected in the way in which in just a few short years, it has become a story source for national as well as state media and for sympathetic policymakers. Please text to give now or go online to support FHJP's important health justice stories project. It's so important. When Miriam told Claudia and me about an old friend's generous match gift, she shared that he was fighting leukemia. We were so moved by Tom's spirit and that of his wife, Gail, who is here with us now. Hello everybody, my name is Gail Davidson and I'm the widow of Miriam's old friend, Tom Gidwitz, who jump-started her pledge drive for the Florida Health Justice Project before he died. Um, I am so moved by Miriam's work as well as the delight she took in Tom's letter. And we were both amazed when we saw the original pledge grow and grow. This is Tom's original letter. I didn't think much about healthcare or health insurance for myself or anyone else until I contracted a fatal disease. In November, 2018, I was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. Since then, I've been hospitalized for chemotherapy, a stem cell transplant, pneumonias, and multiple systemic infections. I've had outpatient chemotherapy, CAT scans, x-rays, countless blood and platelet transfusions, and I've swallowed a river of syrups, washes, and pills. Those treatments and my wife's love and care have kept me alive. And through it all, as I've watched our employee health insurance plan turn a cascade of mind-boggling bills into manageable co-payments, I've shuddered to think how we could survive if we didn't have such coverage. And now I can't help but think of the millions of my fellow citizens who are totally exposed to our expensive health system. I live in Massachusetts, where all residents are guaranteed a basic level of free health care and subsidized health care, depending on their circumstances. Nearly all of my state's residents now have coverage, half of them through the expanded Medicaid program introduced with the Affordable Care Act. Other Americans are not so lucky. Florida is one of 14, now 12, states that do not offer expanded Medicaid coverage, leaving some percentage of its residents totally exposed to the crushing cost of medical expenses, even for minor emergencies and ailments. The Florida Health Justice Project is fighting to bring Medicaid to Florida and to bring affordable coverage to state residents as allowed under current law. My eyes are now open to how expensive healthcare really is and how the ability to pay even small bills is a matter of life and death. That's why I'm an enthusiastic supporter of the Florida Health Justice Project. The project's work is important. It is saving lives. I hope you'll join me in supporting the Florida Health Justice Project. Sincerely, Tom Gidwitz. So that was my husband writing from the point of view of a patient, but 
he did not have to worry about losing his home, breaking up his family, or any of the other secondary follow-ons that come when people are devastated by medical bills that they can't even begin to afford to pay. So this is why Medicaid is so important, not just for health, but for the whole being. I can't stress to you how important this project is for the residents of Florida, and I hope you support the Health Justice Project and everything they do. Thank you so much. As someone from Tennessee, another state that has refused to expand Medicaid, I'm so touched and grateful for those of you in other states who support us in this fight. There's no more important health justice issue, so thank you so much for helping Tom's generous legacy to keep growing. A sobering statistic is that 90% of the folks being denied coverage because of their state's refusal to expand Medicaid live in states like Florida and Tennessee that were once slave states. This is an issue of justice on so many levels, including not the least, an issue of racial justice. We in the South were saved from ourselves 150 years ago, and we were so grateful to friends outside of the region who, like Tom and Gail, continue to help fight for justice in the South. Of course, we aren't relying just on the help of folks beyond Florida. FHJP has wonderful friends much closer to home. One of those is Mary Block, whom I had the pleasure of briefly meeting a while back and learning that we share a common hero, Paul Farmer, and a love of poetry. I've since learned of her family's support of healthcare as a human right, spanning generations from her grandfather to her son. And I understand that she has, as we speak, organized an in-person FHJP Zoom party on an unusual little street in Miami where neighbors come together for causes like supporting health justice. Good evening, my name is Mary Block. I am a neighbor of Miriam's and very fortunate to count myself among the earliest supporters of the Florida Health Justice Project. The first fundraiser was a lemonade stand on our street on Irvington Avenue that was held by my son and my nephew who were two and eight at the time. And I think we raised about $100, which of course Miriam was totally thrilled by and blown away by, um, but not a huge amount of money. But what Miriam and I talked about afterwards was about teaching my son and my nephew about the critical need for health justice in Florida and the work that Florida Health Justice Project is doing in order to advance that. For me, one of the most important aspects of the work that Florida Health Justice project does has been the education that I've received and that they've given to other Floridians about the need for health justice and health equity in South Florida and then the work that they're doing to promote that. Florida Health Justice Project is engaged in the often not terribly glamorous but critical work of advocating for the most vulnerable Floridians uh, and educating the public about the need for health care equity and advocacy here in Florida. For me, the critical work that Florida Health Justice Project is doing is not only advocacy and uh, advancement now, but also laying the foundation for a future in which health care is a guaranteed human right here in the state of Florida. I'm a mother of young children and my dream for them, my hope for them is that they will live in a world where that is a reality. And I'm grateful to Florida Health Justice Project for doing the good work. My youngest daughter, Daisy, was born shortly before uh, Miriam founded Florida Health Justice Project in late 2017. So I remember talking to her when we made down the street about our babies and how they were progressing. And I'm hopeful that Miriam's baby is growing to be healthy and strong because I want my children to grow up and live in a world where healthcare is a human right, where health equity and health justice in Florida is the norm. And Florida Health Justice Project is doing the work 
to make that happen. And I invite you to join me in supporting them tonight. Thank you. One of the things funders and donors should consider is who's on the nonprofit's board. And FHJP's board is so impressive. You're gonna hear next from their first board member and from the one who's most recently joined the board. Paul Nathanson is an icon in the legal services world. I relied on and followed his work for decades. He's the founder of what is now known as Justice and Aging. Zinzi Bailey is nationally known leader in health equity. I just looked at a recent article she published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It should be required reading for all of us who care about health justice and racial justice. I'd like to say I'm very excited to be part of the Florida Health Justice Project. I'm actually now the chair. Um, I was asked uh, by Miriam uh, to be one of the founding members and uh, having heard of her reputation and having moved back to Florida, I actually grew up here. I went to Beach High, but graduated in 1960. I was gone for about 60 years. Uh, coming back to Florida, I realized the, the great need for the kind of services that the Florida Health Justice Project puts together uh, and the incredible staff. So I'm excited to be part of that. Um, I have, and by way of background, spent the last uh, 50 years actually uh, involved in legal services for the elderly poor. Uh, and I've done that through a group that I founded uh, called Justice in Aging. Um, and been involved in Washington with uh, the politics there, as well as uh, legal services provided uh, throughout the country. So bottom line is, uh, I'm retired, I'm in Florida. I think Florida has an incredible need for the kind of services that Florida Health Justice puts together. Uh, the, the failure to expand Medicaid um, and uh, the vulnerable population that we have uh, that is way underserved, it seems to me, cries out for the kind of help and work that Florida Health Justice is doing and that really can do more of if you all are supportive of the effort um, uh, financially. I mean, I, you know, it's always hard to ask for money, but uh, this is a program that has, an, has been in existence for only three years and is doing tremendous work. Um, so we need all the help we can get. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Zinzi Bailey and I'm on the board of FHJP. When Allison asked me to join the board, I didn't hesitate. Um, I worked with Allison in New York City and um, I knew her and I knew her work. Um, and as uh, Paul said, I understood that too few people are doing this kind of work in Florida uh, and we need this type of work. Um, and frankly, we need you. Uh, this type of work takes a lot of resources and every dollar counts. FHJP um, is really necessary in Florida and what happens in Florida affects the entire country. We're all connected. And now before turning you back to Miriam and Allison, I wanna make a final pitch by reminding you of the refrain from Mark's song that I know is running like a loop through your head, donate. And in case you forget, we're gonna play it again at the end. I never thought about running a nonprofit until I was almost 65, which is a crazy time in life to start one from scratch. But I am, I am so lucky that I had this opportunity for two main reasons. First, it gave me a chance to work on something that, quote unquote, feeds my soul. Those are words I, I first heard from Representative Elijah Cummings when he presented at the National Health Law Program Conference in late 2016, after the election. And we thought that we would um, lose the ACA, the Affordable Care Act would be repealed and those decades of work towards universal coverage would be gone. And he said, he thinks we're gonna win this fight because so many of us do this work and support this work because it feeds our souls. And second, while this is by far the hardest and most stressful job I've ever had, I have never in my life felt so much heartfelt gratitude. And that is such a gift. I, I don't have time right now to thank 
all the people who've given me this gift, but I just have to say to this amazing board and advisory board, I love you. I cannot thank you enough for all your generous time and wisdom and support. And shout out to Nancy Cooper, who has led our three fundraisers. We could not exist without successful fundraisers. And they would not have happened, this one included, without Nancy. And to our team of extraordinarily skilled and dedicated advocates, you came together on a shoestring and have made such a difference. You have helped me believe in the same, build it and they shall come. I am so thankful to you. And along with this team, I, we are also grateful to our partners and our funders. Together, we've worked on over 30 grants that have supported our mission-driven work. And finally, since I'm not retiring anytime soon, I am especially grateful to Allison for taking over as executive director. She is one of the most gifted and talented advocates and leaders I've ever met. And I am so looking forward to this next chapter of our health justice journey together. Thank you all so much. Three years ago, I arrived in Miami. I got the family settled in and then began some fairly intensive networking. It quickly became clear that for a lawyer with a focus on health access and health equity, all roads led to Florida Health Justice Project. Miriam brought me onto the team with an almost unnerving enthusiasm. In New York, she said, you may have been one of dozens who did what you do. Here, we need you. I would modify her words to say, we need Florida Health Justice Project. Florida needs Florida Health Justice Project. Seeing Florida through New York tinted lenses, I have been truly stunned by the state's callous failure to meet the most basic needs of Florida's residents. Foundational components to the social safety net, which I took for granted as an advocate in New York, have here been victims of partisanship, leaving our residents to make impossible choices or perhaps worse, left with no choices at all. The data speaks for itself. The Commonwealth Fund's 2020 reports on state's health system performance ranked Florida 41st overall among states, a dispiriting 48th for access and affordability and 44th for disparities. The good news is that three and a half years ago, Miriam had the wisdom and the passion and the guts, all of which are, as you've heard, perfectly characteristic to start Florida Health Justice Project. With not a penny of seed money, just faith and deep expertise and lots of allies. And in those three and a half years, as you've heard, we've done incredible things. And our successes have significant impact, not just across Florida, but across the region. Just as Georgia's postpartum win inspired our own advocacy, so too do our wins inspire and lift up advocacy among our similarly situated sister states. It's fair to say that investing in advocacy in Florida is an investment in regional change. We're in this work for the long haul with champions like Representative Duran fighting alongside us and allies like the legendary Dave Lawrence, former editor of the Miami Herald, who believe passionately in our mission. And critically, we have our funders, our sponsors, the individuals who courageously share their stories and our partner organizations, all the extraordinary advocates fighting this good fight in Florida. And we have you here alongside us making this work possible. So thank you for taking the time to join us tonight to learn about our work and to give what you can. 
There is so much more we can do and we will do with your support. We hope you will raise a glass with us as we send love and gratitude out to you all and toast to past and future victories on the long road to health justice. Who is there to help you out when it comes to health care? HJP's on your side if you have a health scare. Take this occasion, make a donation. Donate.